In a few years, we will rely on helpful and harmless AI systems. That is the premise of today's conversation. Welcome to Exponentially. Today's AI models are complex with hundreds of billions of virtual moving parts. We don't so much as build them as nurture and nudge them. As this technology improves exponentially, how can we trust it? Can we really design these systems to be harmless as well as honest? I've come to San Francisco, the epicenter of the AI revolution, to talk to a man who has staked a lot on being able to do that. Dario Amadai, the founder and CEO of Anthropic. Dario, it's wonderful to have you here. You're a bona fide researcher with papers on AI and AI safety that have been cited more than 30,000 times in just the last seven years. But you are at the epicenter of an enormous explosion in the field of AI today. What does that feel like? I would say that it feels like a mixture of excitement and uh, you know concern at how at how fast things are going. I generally alternate between between the two. You know, on one hand, there's something new and exciting every day that you know that comes from us or that comes from uh, you know one of the other many many players in the space. And I I always look at things and I say, wow, this is so cool. This could be so useful. Um, and you know, then I look at the other side of it and I'm going, this is this is all happening so fast. It's hard for me running a company that makes these things mm -hmm. to keep up with all the innovations that we've done even within the company. I mean, I totally concur with you. I, I've been in the tech industry since the early 90s. I've been through the dot-com bubble, uh, mobile, social. Nothing has been as significant as this. You know, what will this mean for uh, truth on the internet? What will it mean for, for jobs, for white collar and office workers? What will it mean for national productivity and national competition. I mean, these are all questions that, that people are asking and that they're, they're turning to the AI developers in a sense, sense for those answers. Yeah, I think the multifaceted nature of the technology, the generality, means that on one hand, there's this almost endless set of possible positive applications of the technology. But also, when you, know, when you go to list what are the concerns with the technology, that list is also very long. But the other side of that is if we're able to address all those, then you know society will be able to reap all all of these positive benefits that are that are coming at once there's this this challenge that we we face though because the technologies are they're accelerating away this curve that we're all familiar with now the exponential curve but the way that human dynamics work human institutions the way that our laws work our families work the relationships we have in in, in school and, and at work they move much, much slower. They move at a, a more traditional pace. And there is a gap that is emerging. Does that, does that worry you? Yes, I think that's a good way of describing it, which is that we're pouring exponentially more compute into these systems. We're technically able to do it, and we're getting better and better performance when we do that. I also feel that it's too fast. And so I think you know, on the technical side, we need to do more to try and control, measure, steer these models more so than, than we're able to do today. And I think on kind of the business and legal and regulatory side, we need to find ways for societal institutions to adapt faster to the changing technology. AI is one of those terms where it means so many different things to different people. So what does AI mean to you? The systems that we primarily work, build, work on building are so-called large, large language models, mm -hmm. which are systems that you can talk to and they talk back and they can perform tasks for you. They can program, they can answer questions about you know, legal matters or medical matters or any number of topics. So our model, Claude, is an example of this. So well, that, tell me about Claude though, because yes. I heard the name and it's a really cute name. And a friend of mine from school had a, a fluffy skunk that was called Claude. So it always yes. has this a sweet association for me. You know, I think we just wanted a name that sounded like it was a friendly assistant. The term we use is helpful, honest, and harmless. What can I reasonably ask of someone that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm asking for help on something? Well, I want them to be helpful in the task. Um, I don't certainly don't want them to do anything dangerous or harmful, and I don't want them to mislead me. I want them. I want them to be honest. And if someone manages to do those three things, then you know I generally feel like they've done a good job of, of being of being an assistant. I want to bring that back to what an AI system 
is. So is it a system that exhibits those types of human personality characteristics or, or is it something a little bit different? Like the overall definition of AI, right? For the whole field, you know, it can be any, any system that, you know, performs any intelligent or pattern matching task. So it's possible to build AIs with all kinds of different properties. But I think our, our vision and our picture is that we want to build these systems to be helpful, honest, and, uh, and harmless. And if we can achieve those consistently, then systems will be beneficial, beneficial yeah. to society. So I find sometimes if I ask these systems to give my biography, uh, it'll switch my university and then it'll switch the, the, the first place I worked. It still looks really credible, but it's wrong. Yeah, this is this is the insidious nature of kind of the the imperfect uh, systems, right? Where you know the nightmare is, you know, you ask the system for a set of ten facts, and all of it sounds kind of you know professional and credible. Nine of the facts are right, and one of them is wrong in some very important way. Making it good enough so that you can really trust it is one of our top priorities at Anthropic. Probably about a quarter of the of the team at Anthropic uh, focuses on it, but. Still, no one is perfect. We, like everyone else, are still to some extent plagued by this problem. So, you know, and, and solving this, but, it. But this problem exists because of the way that these large language models are structured. We don't even say that they're built. They're sort of grown in a, in a funny sort of way. I mean, I, th I think that's something- Yeah, that, baked that, like a cake or something. Right. They're not built like scaffolding is built or built like a car engine is built where you assemble component after component. No, there's in fact two stages to the training. So in the first stage, you just train the model on a huge amount of text, like a huge amount of the text on the internet. But it's billions of words it's, of text. It's, it's some large fraction of, right. what's, of what's available. Um, and literally, we just train the model to be good at predicting the next word in the sentence. So the model learns a lot about the world when you do this. But honestly, one thing it doesn't learn is that it shouldn't make things up. Right. Uh, because it's it's basically trying to predict what would be plausible if it came next, right. not necessarily what is true. Absolutely. So then there's a second stage of training done in different ways. For example, you know, the state of the art in the field is a, me is a method called RL from reinforcement learning from human feedback. Right. Um, Anthropic uses a different method called constitutional AI. But the purpose of all of these methods is to train the model in terms of what things it should and shouldn't do, right? So it's a little bit like how I might train my young puppy. Yes. Uh, you give it rewards when it does well, and you may treat it slightly differently if it doesn't behave correctly. Is, is it like that, or is it, it more, it, more sophisticated? Yeah, it's, it's actually quite a lot like that. Instead of the owner speaking to the puppy, you just have a human rate how well the models are doing. But you've moved on from this R RLHF, reinforcement learning with human feedback, to constitutional AI, which introduces a second AI system to help train the first one. So basically, in constitutional AI, you write a constitution, uh, which could be anywhere between one page and 10 pages. Right. And it basically states the rules that the AI system could follow. So what are the things that are in your constitution for Claude? It's kind of evolved over time. But, you know, from the beginning, I think we, um, you know, we started with some things from like the UN Charter of Human Rights, right? Things that are kind of hard to hard to disagree with. Then we added some things about, you know, Claude being responsive to the user and various things. There are various kinds of harms that we were, you know, particularly concerned with, you know, kinds of information that are dangerous or illegal. But how can you measure then whether Claude is behaving as you have trained it? That's actually a very difficult and subtle problem, right? Because uh, I think one of the things about these models is that they're incredibly broad. Right. Often a model might know something or not know something or have an opinion on something. And you don't necessarily know about it until, you know, until a million people have used it or right. something. To be clear, I think this is a bad thing. Right. We shouldn't have to deploy the model to a million people to discover that, you know, it, it happens to be an expert on some particular type of weapons that right. you know, we'd rather Absolutely. not talk about that. <laughs> yes. Another example is I don't know the first thing about cricket, but Claude is an expert on cricket. Claude is also an expert on Japanese history. I don't know the first thing about Japanese history. Well, I can history. help you with one of those too. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's not, not the Japanese the history. Yeah. <laughs> and so one of our main areas of research is trying to detect ahead of time all the things that the model is capable of. It's this very open-ended problem. And you know, we're constantly trying to build up kind of evaluations and standards for measuring our model. Software and engineering has been very deterministic. 
Yes. I, you buy a hammer, you know what a hammer does, you know, yes. clunk. You get a piece of software like the calculator on your, on your smartphone, it calculates and will always give you the same results. And the words that you use is that you're, you're working with the model so that it doesn't do things that you would rather it not do. A, a bit like a, a kind uncle talking to their slightly difficult nephew, you know, rather, sort of, just about, these things are opaque. Are you translating technical language into normal English for, for, for my benefit? Or is this process one of rathers and maybes and would be betters? So when you go to train the system, right, you know, it requires thousands of computer chips all working in, 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 in sync. There's an incredible precision to the engineering. You know exactly what you're making. You know exactly what data is going into it. You know exactly how much you know, it, costs, it costs per hour. It has all the hallmarks of precision engineering. Same as like you know, making a semiconductor chip. But on the output, it has exactly the properties that you talk about. It's much more of an art than a science. Mm -hmm. When you look past kind of the form and the, the container into which you're pouring things, the pouring process is very predictable, but what you get out at the other end is, ve is, is very inherently hard to predict. And we're trying to turn it into more of a science, but it's not, it's not inherently so. It doesn't, it doesn't start that way. That's a problem for us to solve. I think of this analogy of uh, the first stereo system that we had at home, and it had a, a bass dial and a treble dial. It had two dials that you could use to adjust the sound. And when I look at these large language models, they have 10 billion, 100 billion, 500 billion dials. You guys call them parameters. Yes. Does the fuzziness come out of that complexity? Yeah, I think it comes out of that complexity. And we're, you know, we're not manually turning each of the dials, right? It's, it's, you know, it's almost like, job. yeah, we have an automated process that kind of decides when any dial should be turned and how much based on the data, the data that, it, that it receives. A lot of people have said over the last five or six years, the problem with neural networks and a large language model is a type of neural network is that they are black boxes. And the point being that you can't look into them and see what the process is in the same way you can't look into my brain at the moment, not without hurting me anyway, uh, and see what the process is. So you're developing methods of peering into that black box. You're developing the instruments and the tools to do that. Yes, this is an area that we've been worked on since the beginning of Anthropic. This was one of our first teams and it's grown over time. And we've found some interesting things that actually parallel what we've seen you know, in the human brain. I used to be a neuroscientist. Right. So you can see the network often using very human-like concepts, but we're really just at the beginning of that, right? We can decode some of what the network does and understand some of the principles behind it. But I think it's, you know, it's gonna be years before that science matures. Is it important to make some breakthroughs in those particular fields in order to deliver verifiably safe AI systems? Yeah, I think that's gonna be one important component because of the fuzziness that we talked about before, right. right? If you understand something about what's going on inside the network, why it does what it does, then you can maybe predict what it's going to do in circumstances you've never, you've never seen before. There are people saying there are behaviors that come out of these networks that weren't designed in that are emerging. And it's given almost a, a sort of a mystical sense around it. What do you understand by this idea of emergent behavior? Yeah, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't attach anything you know, mystical to it any more than I would attach anything mystical to, you know, as humans grow up, they start to understand the world and they have realizations. As the model starts to see something in its training data, you know, it learns to put together the puzzle pieces in different ways. Mm -hmm. You know, writing semantically correct computer code, or, you know, being able to do a particular type of math, or, you know, understanding, you know, the concept of what's legal versus what's illegal. Right. They're not magical, they're not mystical, they're in the training data, but the model at some point learns to put together the pieces when it wasn't able to before. It's just such a complex set of trade-offs because if I know the thing is wrong half the time, I will double check every answer. But if it's only wrong once in a hundred, I'm not going to. And I wonder about whether you foresee some almost chasm that you'd have to leap of safety before these things really can feel safe. Yeah, so I think that's an important problem and we really want to avoid this situation where the models are kind of you know, we become dependent on them or come to rely on them while they may still be sometimes making mistakes that, that we would be able to catch. I think one of the important things is for models to know what they don't know. I think the great thing would be a much more usable 
AI system than the one you described is one where 99% of the time it gets the right answer. And that 1% of the time it says, I don't actually know. Here are some guesses. They might be wrong. But if it's able to kind of signal or signpost that it might not be confident, it's a lot more useful, right? This is yeah. getting back to the honest thing, right? Absolutely. Like it's okay not to know sometimes. These are really powerful technologies and I'll, I'll put my cards on the table. I think they will be the most powerful technologies we'll see in our, our lifetimes. How do we get them into society more broadly in ways that are very, very beneficial? So I think there's kind of two sides to that, right? There's kind of preventing the harms and achieving the benefits. So I think on the preventing the harm side, I mean, the helpful, honest, harmless, looking inside the model, these are both important areas. There's another area I haven't talked about yet, which is ensuring that models kind of stay under effective human control and that we're able to supervise them even as they get smarter than we are. You know, when the models start to know much more than humans do, how do, how do we make sure that humans are able to check and verify their work and that they don't lie to us in ways that, you know, that we can't, we can't detect? In a world where AI systems are prevalent, and many of these systems perhaps are built by anth anthropic, and therefore they're guided by your constitution in your constitutional AI. Are you the right person to set the rules for that constitution? Because the US has a constitution, Germany has a constitution, but that constitution was built by a, a sense of consensus, a sense of accountability yes. and legitimacy. You seem like a really trustworthy guy, but is it fair for that power to reside with you? I, I think actually mostly not. So I think the way we envision it is, uh, you know, there may be a base model that has a very basic constitution, right? And all versions of Claude have these very basic rules, right? They're not going to commit things that, or help with things that, you know, almost all of human society agrees is right. bad. Right. Um, but then, you know, let's say I wanted to make an agent that, you know, helped with something medical versus an agent that served as your lawyer versus a customer service agent versus a therapist. Right. The rules for that are very different. Basically, my answer is that, you know, for 90% for of things, it's not up to us to decide. Um, and then it's kind of only the 10% of things where we think most people would agree and where we, you know, defer as much as we can to societal processes. And there are so many great uh, processes. We, we uh, know, for example, that cars are safer in 2023 than they were in the 1960s because of rules around seat belts and braking systems and, and, and crash testing. We know that when radium was first discovered by Marie Curie, anyone could make a, a, a medical product with radium, radium cough sweets for babies. So what's the process that we should use for uh, AI systems? Should it look like drug approvals or should it look like uh, perhaps the way, uh, a, you know, much lighter weight system, the, the type we have in the auto industry? I think maybe of like cars and airplanes or something like that as, as good examples of kind of powerful technologies that are, you know, that are safety critical where lives are on the line. So, you know, I think we need to move as quickly as possible where and, and, there and are why, some rules of the road. Wh why so quickly? Is it because of the exponential takeoff yeah, I, of the I technology? Think, I think it's the exponential. With another technology, I might say, look, we don't understand the cost and benefits that well. Like, we need to have these things play out in the market a little bit before we start to step in and set regulation that might be too rigid. But that's not my view for AI because it's moving so fast. Right. Because the implications are happening so fast. Is it that the, the the systems are getting faster? Is it that they're getting measurably more powerful? Is it that they're being used more frequently in business? What What, what is this exponential that you're referring yes. to? <laughs> yes, yes to all. <laughs> um, so the exponential is basically the amount of computation, number mm -hmm. of chips times the time we run them, four times the speed of the chips. And each of those factors is getting faster. You know, five or 10 years ago, the amount of money that you would put into training one of these AI systems was the size of an academic research grant. Right. So 100,000 to a million dollars. But I think we're gonna enter an era because the economic value is so great where it's gonna be, you know, a billion dollars or $10 billion. Right, um, but and, we, and we should convert that, that spend into the amount of processing that these big AI supercomputers are doing. Exactly. And they're, they're doing that processing to produce systems that are even more powerful as, 
however we choose to man- measure them. I- I- exactly. And at the same time as that happening, the chips are getting faster right. and more money is going also into making the chips faster. And companies are, are desperate. I mean, I've spoken to the bosses of many very large firms and it, it's really high up on their agenda to figure out how they use these technologies in their businesses. And walking around San Francisco the last few days, I can feel the palpable buzz of people just wanting to build on AI the way they yes. wanted to build on the iPhone 15 years ago. I think on one hand, that's that's really exciting and we benefit from it and others benefit from it. I don't want to do anything to kind of slow down the excitement or the positive benefits, but everyone understands that like, you need to make these things safe and there, there, is no, there is no industry if you don't make these things safe. Absolutely. Exponentials are really, they're really S curves. You know, they go up and then they, they tail yes. off. How long does this exponential run for before it, before it tails off? In other words, is this, is this the last set of innovations that we're gonna need for AI? I would say we have at least a few years of the current exponential and then, you know, people have ways of coming up with new innovations that continue things after that. I think a few years from now, you know, we may get to the point where AI systems can perform these these feats that humans aren't capable of. And we've seen with the AI systems, they're already broader than humans. Right. So if we could get them to the point where they're broader and they're more creative than we are or as creative and able to see all the connections, I really have this hope that human scientists assisted by AI could make progress on these complex diseases as fast as we've made progress on the simple diseases. My hope is if we really get this right, you know, we actually get to the point where this particular cancer is just not a problem anymore. And of course, be, beyond the medical applications yes. into climate change, into dis- you know, poverty elimination, into all sorts of problems that we as humans all, all have found. All problems of complexity, complexity. Beyond, beyond human scope. Right. You know, the premise of, of our, our discussion is that you know, in five years, we could all be using good, trustworthy AI systems just as part of normal life. Do you think that could become reality? Yeah, I I think that could. So, you know, let's assume we get right all the kind of rules of the road, safety, helpful, honest, harmless. If we solve all those problems, I do think that everyone could have an AI assistant that they really trust. Your whole way of interacting with the world could be done through this AI assistant. It can help you make better decisions in your life and say, hey, like, you know, I think you'd be happier if you did X instead of Y, tailored to the way you want it to be that helps you to be to be the best version of yourself. Well, maybe in five years time, my AI assistant can meet your AI assistant <laughs> right here and we can see how well the two of us did. Let's, same place, same time. Let's, let's see if we can fulfill that bet. <laughs> Reflecting on my conversation with Dario, I'm struck by how he acknowledges that the pace of change in AI is exponential. It's going to get so much more capable. But he's also very attentive to the problem of harm and very thoughtful about it. It made me feel much more comfortable. But it's also clear that the way in which we describe what we want from these AI systems cannot be left to the developers. It needs to be led by legitimate governments or citizens like us. I'm Azim Azar, and you've been watching Exponentially. <laughs>